Hello, my name is Susan Hawthorne. Um, I'm the publisher along with Renata Pine of, the, of Spin Effects Press. Um, I'd like to begin with a welcome to country. We respectfully acknowledge the wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their custodianship of the lands and waterways. The countries on which Spin Effects offices are situated are Jiru, Bunurong and Burundjeri, Wadawurong, Ayora and Noongar. We also acknowledge the many women throughout history who have fought for women's freedom and the freedom of lesbians, often at the cost of their lives. So um, it's very wonderful to be here and to be able to be launching Sheila's um, fabulous book. Um, and so I'm just going to now begin uh, just by introducing our speakers for this evening. Betty McClellan and Anna Kerr are the two launchers. Betty McClellan. Now, Betty has been in my life quite a long time. Um, and I can't actually remember when we met, but it has to have been early 1990s or late 80s. And Betty has... Uh, been an incredible activist in Townsville uh, and uh, also is the author of a number of different books, among them Beyond Psych Oppression, Help, I'm Living with a Man Crossed Out Boy, uh, Unspeakable, and also Anne Hannah, which is a biography of her grandmother. Uh, and Betty uh, is uh, used to run a listserv uh, and called Feminist Agenda, which kept us all in touch. That was the days before uh, social media. So, Betty, I'm going to hand over to you now, and then I'll introduce Anna when we get after your talk. Thank you, Susan. I've just unmuted myself. Um, it's just really good to be here. And look, I'll tell you, uh, anyone who's read this book, this is a really great book. And um, I do want to thank Renata and Susan uh, from Spin Effects for giving me this opportunity to speak about it um, at this launch. It, like it's, it's a privilege to talk about Sheila's book. And I love the title, Sheila, Penile Imperialism, The Male Sex Right and Women's Subordination, because that's exactly how it is. Yes, it's male privilege. Yes, there's coercive control. Yes, consent is important. All of these words have entered the language these days, and that's good. But Sheila reminds us that it's much more than all of that. There's a never talked about male sex right. Now, for decades now, I have been appalled, as have many of you I know, by the fact that often when a rape occurs, the man, the rapist, is left out of the equation. A woman has been raped, we hear. But there doesn't seem to be much interest in asking by whom or how does this happen in a civilised society? These kinds of questions aren't popular. In fact, unless the victim is determined to lay charges, the whole sordid event just disappears out of sight. And why? because the male sex right is presumed and accepted. Men doing what men do, and that's the end of the story. But this book says, no, it certainly is not the end of the story. Every incident of rape, every incident of sexual harassment, every industry that thrives on the exploitation of women, by men, that is the prostitution industry, pornography industry, the trans industry, every se sexual fetish, the normalizing of sexual violence must be interrogated. That's what this book says. And its role in the subordination and destruction of women must be revealed. That's what it's about. It's certainly strong stuff. Now, look, I want to mention Kate. We don't know her last name, but all of us who are Australian feminists remember the story of Kate, revealed just a couple of years ago. When Kate was 17, she was brutally raped by a man in her circle of friends at university. 
Her alleged rapist, Christian Porter, was 18. She was 17, he was 18. Porter was a brilliant student who went on to become Attorney General of Australia when he was 47. Kate also was a brilliant student from what we're told. And she spent her life in and out of therapy. From bits of the story we know, she hadn't told anyone about the rape until one day in her 40s, she'd had enough. She wrote it all down, sent it off to selected politicians, and then killed herself. Now, this is a real live example of how the male sex right, is, it not only subordinates women, but it also destroys women, as Sheila points out so clearly. Now, you know, parts of this book I found really hard to read because I never want to confront the fact that there exists, for example, a pedophile liberation movement or the I also never want to um, confront the fact that there is the normalizing of sexual violence through sadomasochism, bondage, and so on. Oh, of course I know such practices exist. Of course I do. But I find them too difficult. However, Sheila forces us to confront them because they do exist. And as feminists, we cannot look away. Now, I want to spend a moment now focusing on my own profession, psychotherapy, because throughout the book, Sheila does a, such a good job of exposing how complicit therapists and the therapy industry have been in supporting the male sex right to the detriment of women. The so-called sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s was lauded at the time as being something wonderful for both women and men. All consenting adults were encouraged to explore their sexuality. And the role of therapists was to help people do away with their inhibitions and really get into it. Except, as Sheila points out, the sexual revolution turned out to be pretty one-sided. Men were freer, men were bolder, and what we saw was sexual harassment was rife, date rape, acquaintance rape, the demand for prostitution grew, men's consumption of pornography went through the roof. That was the sexual revolution. And what about women? More and more women were consulting therapists during that time, or since that time, I should say, distressed about the fact that they didn't want to participate in the extreme kinds of, of sex their porn-saturated partners wanted. And, of course, most therapists saw their role as helping women find ways to enjoy their partner's newfound sexual freedom. The male sex right was accepted as a given, and if women would only adapt to it, they could enjoy it too. Now, that was the therapist's role, is to try to encourage the woman, unless the therapist was a feminist, in which case she would say something like, look, if you don't want to participate in his sexual exploits, then you must not do it, and so on. We had a totally, feminist therapist had a totally different role from what we were supposed to be doing during that time. Now, Toward the end of the book, Sheila has a chapter called Transvestism and the Erasure of Women that you really must read more than once. After all that we feminists have fought for, all the battles won, all the goals achieved, now through the trans movement, supported by big money, the medical and therapy industries, politicians, universities, and so on, the aim is clearly the erasure of women. It's like patriarchy couldn't break our spirit, couldn't mould us into the kind of women they wanted us to be, so men are now becoming women. Fabricated women, of course, constructed women, and they are attempting 
to obliterate the real thing, which is us. Gender, that is the socially constructed characteristics of what it means to be male and female, the socially constructed characteristics is now being promoted as much more real than sex. That is the sex of your birth, your double X or XY chromosomes. It's madness, we all know that. It's madness, but here we are having to contend with our language being changed and our space invaded. Sheila refers to a linguistic minefield. Jobs are lost, reputations destroyed if you happen to use the wrong pronoun, or if you dare to say mother and breastfeeding. And women-only spaces, uh, spaces we fought for because we had ample evidence that women were not safe in mixed-sex spaces, are now being invaded by men. Toilets, changing rooms, women's prisons. Sheila gives examples of women refusing to use same-sex toilets and instead queuing up to use women-only toilets. Women are fighting back against the male sex right. And in the final chapter, Sheila gives us hope. Feminist resistance. It's so gratifying to know just how much is being done around the world to resist this renewed attempt at subordinating women even further. And Sheila goes through all of the things that are happening, the Me Too movement, the campaigns to abolish prostitution, the continued struggle against pornography, strident challenges to transgender rights by lesbian groups, women's international, women's declaration international, and so on. There is hope in the strength of our resistance, as Sheila reminds us. So let's never lose hope. I commend this amazing book to you. As we have come to expect from Sheila Jeffries, penile imperialism is the result of comprehensive research and a deep passion for truth and justice. And it's eminently readable. So thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, it's lovely to hear you speak. Uh, our next speaker is Anna Kerr. Uh, Anna uh, runs the Feminist Legal Clinic in Sydney and last year the uh, Sydney, um, uh, what are they called, the City, City oh. Council um, actually uh, evicted her from, from the place that she had where there was a, a supported rent um, and uh, it's, it's very difficult when you uh, are knocked about by this particular trans lobby. Um, the other thing is that recently she was kicked out of the Green Party, uh, again, for the same reason, the Greens have become completely pro-trans. But a very important thing that Anna does every single day is that she puts out her uh, newsletter, um, which is called Feminist Legal Clinic. And maybe at the end, Anna, you can put up the link for that because I can't see it. Um, and that's very important and it, it helps me keep up with uh, everything that is going on and there is so much going on. Uh, so um, over to you, Anna. Thank you. Yes. Thanks very much, Susan. I'm pleased to hear that you follow that blog. I'm, I'm, not, I'm never sure how many people do follow it, but uh, it's really an archive for me of news articles. It's really just a news digest. But, yeah, some people like it, so it's good to hear. Um, okay, well, look, this book, um, beautiful book, love the cover. Despite the disturbing content covered in penile imperialism, it is, it carries a very positive feminist message because it suggests that male behaviour is capable of change. Wow. Sheila writes that understanding that male sexuality is socially constructed is fundamental to this book. So this suggests that despite their claims to the contrary, men can choose to act differently, if only they would. Uh, however, there are many grim realities covered in this book that I think women must confront 
if we want to work to compel men to change. The book begins with uh, Sheila recounting the rise of sexology and with it the narrative that men are controlled by their compelling sexual urges and cannot help but dominate women sexually. Uh, the belief that male sexual aggression is natural and inevitable is very convenient uh, in often freeing men from culpability for rape, exploitation and harassment of women and girls. And these topics are considered by Sheila in detail in chapters three and four. Uh, how we, however, we know that men can resist their sexual urges because, as Sheila says, we would otherwise have men raping women in the supermarket aisles next to the breakfast cereals. Uh, and we know that doesn't happen. So although they'd like us to believe they have no control over themselves, they can if they want to. Sheila also talks about the liberating of perversions. Uh, there's a chapter on the rise of kink and the normalising of sexual violence. There's also a chapter discussing the pedophile liberation movement, which regards child abusers as a persecuted sexual minority. Of course, they prefer the euphemism minor attracted persons to destigmatize what they claim is an innate sexual orientation outside their control. In the penultimate chapters, Sheila discusses how the fetish for cross-dressing or transvestism has been elevated to being the latest compelling human rights cause. And again, its proponents claim that the urge to, to dress and present themselves in a feminine manner is deeply rooted in their biology. So bizarrely, while arguing that sexual orientation and fetishes and what they call gender identity, they, they argue that all these things are innate and incapable of change. Uh, in contrast, they claim that biological sex is fluid, uh, with laws now in some jurisdictions allowing for it to be changed every 12 months, or at least for its legal record to be changed on birth certificates, et cetera. Uh, so men, it seems, have claimed the right or the ability to change sex, uh, despite all appearances to the contrary, because it's actually not possible, but, but they claim that they cannot change the rest of their sexual urges. They cannot change, they, they cannot, for instance, overcome their urge to coerce, beat, rape, humiliate, and mock women. Those, those urges, for instance, are uncontrollable, apparently. Um, apparently, these urges are either innate or so deeply grounded, in, based in their unconscious, that they have no choice in the matter. So we're meant to believe poor men. On the other hand, the same sexologists uh, appear to put about a narrative in relation to women, which conveys the impression that we are spoiled for choice. According to the sexologists, any lack of enthusiasm or reluctance on the part of women is dysfunctional and can be overcome. Sheila writes how sexology liberated sex from Victorian prudery only to oppress us with the concept of the frigid woman. It seems we women must train ourselves to be enthusiastic about aggressive male sexuality and to accommodate their fetishes for fear of otherwise being labeled frigid. I think it would be understandable if women were to yearn for a return to so-called Victorian prudery. Women today can't even lie back and think of feminism because they're too busy being strangled or having their anuses violently penetrated. Imagine a time when it was acceptable to tolerate vanilla sex rather than having to endure kinky or rough sex to win male approval. Sheila narrates how Victorian feminist campaigners challenged men's sexual behavior because it led to marital rape, sexual abuse of children and exploitation of women and girls in prostitution. Prudes indeed, if we take the old meaning of the word meaning brave women. Clearly nothing has really changed, except that instead of turning a blind eye and maintaining a stiff upper lip, women are now expected to consent to these same activities and to be empowered by them. Yes, even pedophilia has joined the list of supposedly feminist demands. Sheila makes reference to the so-called feminist declaration signed in 2020 by 200 women's rights, LGBT and transgender organizations from around the world which had among its demands lowering the age of consent. 
Sexology and its teachings that male sexuality is biologically determined has done its best to neutralize feminism and is now working towards destigmatizing and normalizing sexual violence, the paraphilias, and even the abuse of children. The genius in all this is that it's all being accomplished with women's consent. And indeed, on one superficial view of things, women are consenting to the dismantling of feminism in their enthusiasm to embrace sex positivity and transgenderism and to avoid being condemned as swerfs or turfs, which seem to be the latest terms for frigid prudes or perhaps the latest term for witches in an earlier incarnation. And so it is that many women will repeat the mantras that sex work is work and trans women are women, all those um, present accepted, of course. As a lawyer, I share Sheila's scepticism about the quality of the consent being provided, even when it is seemingly so enthusiastically given. As Sheila discusses in her book, consent requires that there is a choice and some equality of bargaining power and how many women would still prostitute themselves if they had the financial and social support to escape prostitution? And how many women consent to sexual encounters because they feel coerced, whether financially, emotionally, or socially? How many women would still contract to sell their babies in return for payment if they weren't suffering financial duress? It's interesting to observe that in other legal contexts, such as medical negligence or fraud, the law talks about informed consent. However, in the context of sexual assault, the word informed does not feature in the legislation. Imagine the consequences if it did. How many women and girls would reconsider agreeing to uncomfortable, even painful sexual encounters if they knew the man had no intention of pursuing a relationship with them or even seeing them again or was involved in infidelity or had you know, uh, venereal diseases? There's so many things that, that women could be informed about which they are there's nothing legally requires for them to know. Contract law seems to apply to all agreements except those that protect women's feelings and welfare. It, for instance, the marriage contract, even a fundamental breach such as infidelity is not actionable. There's no compensation for a broken agreement in this area. How many women would withdraw their consent to sex with their husbands if they knew of his infidelities? It's arguable that without sharing this information, a wife's consent is obtained on false pretenses. Without this information, a woman is also unwittingly exposing herself to an unknown risk of contracting a sexually transmitted disease. It wouldn't pass muster in a medical negligence, but apparently within the marriage relationship, it's fine. So I won't go into the various forms of coercion men resort to in manufacturing consent within the marriage because Sheila does that very well in chapter two of her book. But I do think about how many women would remain in relationships characterized by domestic violence if they were offered the financial means and social support to live independently. In the course of my domestic violence advocacy work, I'm often confronted by women who wish to withdraw their applications for apprehended violence orders. They insist that they forgive him and they want to have him back. And often, and this is often despite a very disturbing history of assaults against them. And I sometimes ask them whether they'd still want him back if they won the lottery. And suddenly their undying love for him evaporates as they imagine happier alternatives. Sadly, I can't give them a winning lottery ticket and too often they are reconciled with the perpetrator of violence against them. They consent, but is this real consent? Did they have a real choice? If you look at the consequences for many women leaving these abusive relationships, you can find that there is very little choice for many women. Our family laws and, and our welfare system really don't give women a lot of choice. I also wonder how, um, how many women would tolerate a man's cross-dressing if they knew it was a fetish cultivated through extensive use of pornography rather than a deep-seated gender identity outside their control. I suspect that our compassionate instincts are being manipulated in, in many contexts. And of course, I wonder whether all these young people taking hormones and having surgeries uh, would go ahead with these medical interventions that mutilate and sterilize them if they were fully informed. So there are many questions about the manipulation of the concept of consent and choice, which need to be explored. 
but um, Sheila does a great job examining all these extraordinary and disturbing developments and much more, including the attempted erasure of women uh, before coming to her conclusion. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. And now we pass over to Sheila. Um, Sheila Jeffries is a radical feminist, writer and activist. She's worked mainly against male violence and for lesbian feminism. She joined the women's liberation movement uh, originally in the UK in 1973. And then in 1991, she moved to Australia to teach at the University of Melbourne, where we got to know her better than previously. Uh, she is now a prof professorial fellow in the School of Social and Political Sciences. Then she moved back to the UK in 2015 and she's the author of 11 books on issues such as the history of sexuality, lesbian feminism, prostitution, gay men's politics, beauty practices, uh, the threat of patriarchal religion to women's rights and the politics of transgenderism. Her most recent books are The Lesbian Revolution, Lesbian Feminism in the UK, 1970 to 1990. Uh, her autobiography, Trigger Warning, My Lesbian Feminist Life, and uh, now her latest, Penile Imperialism. Uh, she's also the director of uh, Women's Declaration International. Sheila, welcome, and thank you for writing such a fabulous book. Thanks very much, Susan, and thanks very much to Anna and Betty for their splendid introductions as well. And it is lovely to be here, and I recognise quite a few names of women who are here, women that I have not seen for a very, very long time, like a, a sort of 20 years or more in some cases. So it's lovely to be here speaking to you. Now, I thought, first of all, I should explain um, where I see the book as coming from. In the Acknowledgements at the front of the book, I explain that the ideas in the book come from the thinking of wonderful radical feminists at the time of the women's liberation movement in the 1970s and 80s. So they don't come from nowhere. Um, they were wonderful uh, ideas that we were developing on uh, male sexuality, on violence against women. And I think at the time we thought that these ideas could not be lost but of course they have been. They're certainly not taught in universities and many of the books are not in print and so on and so on. So this book builds on and se seeks to bring back those terribly important ideas again. Now, I was using the term penile imperialism back in the 70s. It's the way we used to speak then. Indeed, there's a paper online in which I use that term and it's from 1976. And the paper is called Worker Control of Reproduction. And in that paper, I was arguing that women's main production was children and we needed worker control, which meant, of course, access to abortion, contraception, rights over children, and by implication over men's sexual access. We liked big ideas back then, and we liked to join things together, but that's not really done now. Each aspect of women's oppression these days tends to be looked at in isolation. So what I'm trying to do in this book is look at how all the ways in which the exercise of male sexuality, or the male sex right, as I call it, constructs the confines and the miseries of women's lives under male domination. I look at how women's experiences of everything from everyday sex in the marital bed and see how that is joined to sex murder and nappy fetishism. And of course, transvestism, which is now more usually called transgenderism. My main reason for writing the book was that I felt I needed to explain more clearly where what is called transgenderism comes from. The book follows on from my <clears throat> book, Gender Hurts, which was published in 2014, which was critical of what's called the transgender rights movement and its harmful, harmful impact on women's rights. In the years since it was published, the movement, 
which I understand as a men's sexual rights movement, has had considerably more impact internationally, and it's rolling back women's rights. And also, of course, a renewed feminist movement has developed in response to challenge men's prerogatives. Now, the gains that the activists have achieved have depended upon the myth that men who adopt what they see as feminine behaviors are motivated by some essence of gender or gender identity that has afflicted them and which makes them into an oppressed category of persons. I have become acutely aware that there is not sufficient understanding that the so-called transgender rights movement was started by and created to serve the interests of transvestites, men who are masochistically sexually excited by imitating women's oppression. There is, of course, no human right to imitate and pretend to be a member of a category of oppressed people. No human right for white people to pretend to be black or able-bodied people to pretend to be disabled. There is no such thing as transgender rights. But unfortunately, there were, there are women calling themselves feminists who say they believe that there are such a thing as true trans. That is men who genuinely have a gender identity which makes them women. So as well as lots of men who are pretending, there are apparently, they say, some true ones. So I realized that I needed to be clearer about where the idea of transgenderism came from. And in this book, I place transvestism, as it has traditionally been called until the 1990s, within the history of the liberation of male sexuality that's taken place since the sexual revolution, so that the sexual motivation of the behavior is clear. Transvestism, like other forms of what the sexologists once called sexual perversions, and now call for the sake of politeness paraphilias, is an expression of what I call here the male sex right. There are, and many others of course, there's coprophilia, the love of shit, there's coprophagy eating shit, there's urolagnia, which is the love of urine, uh, there's capillary kleptomania, which is men who cut off women's hair to masturbate into, there's foot fetishism, there's paedophilia, and so on and so on and so on. So there's a great variety of men's fetishes, and the history of transvestism is that that is where it fits, and it was always seen as belonging. The paraphilias then represent more unusual forms of male sexual behavior. Until the gay liberation movement of the 1970s, homosexuality was included amongst lists of sexual perversions. But the gay rights movement was successful in getting homosexuality destigmatized and um, the removal of penalties, and it was removed as a psychiatric diagnosis in 1973. Homosexuality is very different, though, from the paraphilias because it's about wanted sexual relationships between adults and it doesn't have victims. The paraphilias that are examined in this book are forms of male sexual behavior which do have victims and have harmful effects on women's lives. They exist in great variety and they're serviced and created by pornography. They are assumed mainly to be natural by the sexologists. They're natural or they've been created by the fact, this is what the psychoanalyst would say, a boy at the age of five glimpsed his nursemaid's shoes and got excited or, or something of that kind. Feminists have not sought to explain these uh, paraphilias, though, but I think we must do so. I think also there is a feeling amongst women, understandably, they do not wish watch pornography because they don't wish to, and it's too distressing. They don't read about sexual perversions because why should they, what they've got to do with them? But I try to say in this book why it's important that we do, because we need to understand male sexuality and how all of these things are linked to the sexual landscape, the frightening sexual landscape that women now find themselves in. The platform for the liberation of the perversions was the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. And the liberalization of attitudes is exemplified by a controversial but well-known book published in English in 1966 by Lars Ullerstam, The Erotic Minorities, 
a sexual bill of rights. So there we've got the first point at which the, the sexual perversions are called something uh, men have a right to practice. It was originally published in Sweden. Sweden was seen as a sort of the, um, the fount of the sexual revolution at that time. Now, Orlestam presents a manifesto for male sexual interests and he turns them into rights demands and he rails against what he calls the old moralist cruelty, which created laws to prevent exhibitionist paedophiliacs and certain forms of scopophiliacs, that's pornography, looking at pornography, from ever being able to satisfy their sexual urges. And he explains that what were once called perversions must be destigmatized. Now, that is what has happened. In subsequent decades, the development that he saw as so necessary, the normalization of these practices came to pass as the sexual revolution came into new force, into full force. And we got movements to liberate the perversions. Um, we got, for instance, the um, paedophile liberation movement, which a whole, a whole chapter in the book is devoted to the paedophile liberation movement, which was called such at the time, and so on. So the the book is composed of two halves. The first half sets out what I call the male sex right in action, and it shows how it creates penile imperialism. I wanted to make it plain that women live under penile imperialism, which is a regime in which men are assumed to have a sex right of access to the bodies of women, and it's, it, which it's delineated by sexologists, the scientists of sex, protected by governments and the law, reproduced in culture and so on. And I, I said that penal imperialism, a reign of terror in which men exercise their sex rights in which ways which profoundly harm the human rights of women and girls to dignity, privacy, safety, movement, expression, political representation, opportunities, and even to their lives. For instance, um, the, the male sex right is exemplified in the fact that women walking to work or walking home at night must be alert to the fact that a man may abduct and murder them. In the case of Sarah Everard in the UK in 2021, for instance, that man was a serving police officer. So I argue that the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s unleashed a specifically male sexual liberation. It created a righteous sense amongst many groups of men that they should be able to realize their sexual freedom a freedom which generally involves being able to sexually use women and children. And from the global sex industry, to coercive sex in relationships, sexual harassment, sex murder, to the liberation movement spawned by the sexual paraphiliacs, the book details the ways in which the expression of the male sex right creates a frightening and exploitative world in which women must struggle to negotiate their way. And as Anna, emphasized the book starts from the understanding that male sexuality is not natural the form it takes is not natural but socially constructed from the power relations of male domination it's a ruling class sexuality but nonetheless within society within within the law um, within medicine male sexuality is seen as natural and inevitable that the idea that sexual expression might be political and could play a role in the subordination of women is pretty much expunged from public discussion. Now, um, I have no space today to talk about all the different aspects of penile imperialism in operation, but I will say just a little bit about what I call everyday sex, which is that which takes place on a regular basis in heterosexual relationships. I show in the book how much this is resented and unwanted by many women, but they have no right to refuse. It's particularly resented by older women for whom it is very painful. Um, so there is much good feminist research which shows that women of all ages from their teens to old age suffer huge harm from being unable to stop the sexual use of their bodies by male sexual partners. Women tell of not feeling they can't say no and men using them though they're crying and so on. None of this is called sexual violence and it's not recognized as such. So what is the answer? The answer to this of male domination is something called consent education. And this has already been talked about. 
um, by Anna, but the, uh, I think the important thing about the whole concept of consent is that it shows very dramatically and very clearly what is wrong with the whole idea or notion of what sex is under male domination, because um, consent is nothing to do with pleasure. It's nothing to do with the personhood of another human being, nothing to do with liking, nothing to do with relationship. Consent is a model which says that men who under male domination have the sexual initiative can simply use the body of a woman or child, even if they are unconscious, well, they shouldn't be using a child under the law, but of course they do, um, even if they're unconscious, because consent means that um, a woman has to say no, she has to say it very clearly. She doesn't have to, um, you know, if, if a man is going to use her, there's no question that she might like what is going to happen. It's just a model of total passivity of a woman and activity to get his pleasures of a man. I mean, what an extraordinary idea. So what happens is in the universities, in schools, girls and women are basically given the responsibility for male sexual violence. They're told if their nose are not clear enough, then that is when a man will be sexually, toward, uh, sexually violent towards them. But of course, um, consent is something women cannot easily exercise. Um, it is rude to say no simply to an invitation to go and see your mother for dinner. That's how it is in this society. It's particularly rude to say no if women say no to men and the man may be violent. He may go into a nasty mood for 24 hours. So women. Women have no actual right and no ability to consent, but we have this extremely model, uh, extra, extraordinary model of sexuality where sex is seen as something so dangerous, like you know, in medicine, you have to give consent if you're going to have your leg cut off. So sex is seen as something so dangerous, so unpleasant for, uh, for, many, for women perhaps, that they have to give consent before a man can do it. I mean, it's an extraordinary model, but it's absolutely dominant and shows how we have to totally transform the understanding of sex and how it works in order for women to have any chance of equality. Now, the second half of the book looks at the way that the political movements were formed by men for the advancement of the sexual perversions. And I look at what um, is euphemistically called pedophilia, it's just child sexual abuse, of course, sadomasochism, now more usually called BDSM, including nappy fetishism, and transvestism, now more usually called transgenderism. And all of these movements that were uh, set up to normalize these practices and legalize these practices where they were apparently illegal before, they have a program which they follow. And it's mostly based, unfortunately, on homosexual liberation. And they try to liken themselves to being sort of sexual orientations like homosexuality. Although of course there is no similarity at all. So what do they do? What are the tactics they use? Well, they focus on the medical profession first and they seek to destigmatize their practice so that it's seen as something quite normal and therefore not anything to do with a mental disability. They change the language used to describe their practice so that now paedophiles are called minor attracted persons, which they think sounds better. They pressure the legislators to try and change the law. In the case of paedophilia in the 1970s, the paedophile groups tried to reduce the age of consent to four or abolish it altogether. Then they campaign to change policies and get themselves into the public eye on television and so on. Each of the sexual perversions I look at in the book is at a different stage in this process. Of course, transvestism has done extremely well. So we now have in the law, something called transgender rights. They have the rights to pretend to be women in women's places, in women's toilets everywhere. Um, and they have the right to shut women up and say that women may not say that they are not women, but actually men and so on. So it's gone a long way, that movement. It's the most successful of them all. The other sexual perversion liberation movements have not that done as well. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about paedophilia. Um, it was the first chapter I wrote because it formed a sort of template for what I was trying to say in the book. And I explain in the book that in the 1970s, early 1980s, there was an extraordinary degree of public acceptance of, of men's child sexual abuse, paedophilia. Um, there's a difference usually established between paedophilia, which is seen as something that, you know, where men love children, and they're just very attracted to them and can't do anything about it, and child sexual abuse, which is normally seen as taking place in the home or opportunistically, which is something different. 
of course, that is a false distinction. The men's desire for children in the 1970s was accepted in gay men's organizations, of course, and in their publications in the UK. And the National Council for Civil Liberties, now Liberty, accepted the legitimacy of the campaign to get sexual, to get legal access to children. But feminists fought these uh, reduction of the age of consent that these men were demanding. I was in a radical fe feminist group in Leeds campaigning against these men's demands, and we were successful. And in fact, um, I found evidence that in France, in the USA, feminists fought these men's demands and were remarkably successful. And that's one of the things I seek to emphasize at the end of the book is that we can fight this. And we have successfully fought it in the past. Unfortunately, we have to fight it all over again. Uh, in the 1980s, there were some prosecutions of the uh, paedophile activists for child porn and so on, and they went a bit quiet. Um, but in the last 10 years or so, we can see a lot much, a, a lot more acceptance and a lot more activity. Uh, the name's been changed to minor attracted persons because it's apparently destigmatizing. And paedophile activists have got large parts of the medical and criminology professions and the academic professions to accept that their interest in raping children is a sexual orientation and it's biological. And they've gained considerable acceptance of the, the idea that there are good paedophiles, what they call non-contact paedophiles. Um, these ones, apparently the good ones, may fantasize and use sex dolls, but they won't touch a child. I found the discussion and promotion of child sex dolls on the website of Prost Asia very disturbing. Prost Asia purports to be aimed at preventing child prostitution in Asia. It clearly enables the promotion of child sex abuse on its discussion boards. And on its discussion boards, one producer of child sex dolls reassures his customers that in order to avoid unwelcome attention at customs, the doll's genitals could be sent separately. Now, every so often in my research for this book, there are little things that really set me back on my heels, and I have to say, that statement on the public discussion boards of Prost Asia really did shock even me. Now, the devotees of sexual use of children, the academic literature tells us, need more social acceptance because stigma may make them offend. Apparently, if they don't feel good about themselves and their interests, they may sexually attack children. But that's quite a catch-22. But, it, but this is in the academic criminological literature. It's actually being said. Either we accept the paedophiles, in which case they will not abuse, or we remain critical, in which case they will abuse. I mean, how have we reached this point? So while reading this very sympathetic criminology literature, usually written by women, on the need to accept child sex abusers. I have in my mind an image of a man talking to a neighbor who has a 12 year old son. Don't worry, he says, I'm a non-contact, my not minor attracted person. It's a sexual orientation, so I cannot change it, but I am no danger to your Jimmy. This of course seems to us absurd, but it is the way that things are going. And we have to work all over again against the demands of pedophiles. Now, I'm not going to describe in any detail, obviously, because I simply don't have time, the other forms of sexual perversion and the sexual perversion liberation movements that I talk about in the book. Um, but what I do try to do at the end of the book is leave the readers with some hope because the book is difficult to read as it was difficult for me to read the literature that I had to read to write it. So I thought I need to say something to, to end on a note of hope. One note of hope, of course, is that particularly as a result of trans, the transvestite liberation movement, there is the development of a new feminist movement, a new really strong feminist movement, movement internationally, which is absolutely fantastic. We're meeting each other and I'm meeting with wonderful women in countries all over the world and working with them on this issue. But also I try to say in this last chapter that we've had successes before, as we did with paedophilia, and as we did in many countries with getting the Nordic model on prostitution, which punishes the buyers 
um, and helps the women to escape so that we can move forward on many fronts. And I'm really hoping that this book will help us to fight back. Thank you, sisters. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to hear you speak about your book and to um, give a kind of summary. I know, but you, you really, everybody, you really need to read Sheila's, Sheila's book. Uh, it is possible now to ask a few questions. You can either do so in the chat where you can raise your, uh, you can, where you can write a question or in the reactions area, you can raise your hand and we'll be able to see you raise your hand. So the reactions area is just to the right of share screen uh, down the bottom of the thing. At least that's how it is on my computer. So any questions, uh, comments? You can also ask questions of Anna and Betty, and Betty and Anna may, may want to say something more too. There was a question from Caitlin to Sheila. How do you stay sane in doing this research? And of course, we have asked the same question of her for her research that she did on um, sex dolls and sex robots and Woman hating. So, Sheila, a question to you from Caitlin. How do you stay sane doing this research? <laughs> yes, and I also, when I saw that question in the chat, said I could have exactly the same question for Caitlin because she's looked at all the horrendous material on sex dolls, including child sex dolls and so on. So I think, you know, we may be able to answer each other, which is, I don't know, you, you know you have to do it and you have to plough through it because you know that you want other women to know about it. So there really isn't a choice. You have to plow through the stuff. Fortunately, there's there are amusing moments. I mean, you know, some of the stuff about nappy fetishism is amusing, for instance. So there, there are amusing moment, moments when you're going through the literature. And there's also um, some, I suppose, some pleasure in finding just the most frightful things that you know you're gonna be able to explain to people. They say the most dreadful things. And they let, you know, they they show who they really are. And that's that's kind of wonderful. So sometimes I shriek and go, my goodness, they can't have said this. They can't have said this. But they do. It's all out there. And knowing you're going to be able to put that forward and deliver it to people, there is some satisfaction in that. But otherwise, I don't know what to say in, in answer to that. Only that I have always, I have always had a feminist movement around me from which I have drawn support. That wasn't true in the early 2000s. Very bad times when there wasn't a movement to get support from. But there is again now, which is fantastic. I think you have to feel there, that your sisters are out there and that they support you in doing this work. Otherwise, it's really difficult. Sheila, there's a question in the chat. Can you say something about the conflation of gender identity and um, sex identity? I think that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, gender identity with sexual identity and transgenderism. Yes, I'm not completely sure what is being asked here. Um, I don't know what sexual identity is. I suppose that's my problem. There's sex and there's gender identity and there's sexuality, which is to do with whom you love and who you're attracted to. But I'm not sure about conflation of gender identity and sexual identity. I might need some Is sexual clarification. Identity and sexual orientation. Oh, does it mean that? Ah, okay. Um, yes, I'm. I'm not familiar with that term. Um, gender identity and sexual orientation. Uh, there are various ways in which there's a conflation, of course, such as in the transgendering of children. The vast, vast majority of children who are transgendered are female, and the vast, vast majority of those are girls who are sexually attracted to other girls. So there is obviously a conflation there, and indeed some say that um, it almost looks like an attempt to wipe out lesbians at a very young age. It's very, very much directed at lesbians, but also young gay boys are, are suffering in this way as well. So I guess that's one way 
in which there's a conflation. I'm not sure nothing else is coming to me at the moment. In, in terms of the, the way in which the laws are being made, like the self-ID and so forth in, in oh. Queensland, the, the governments are conflating gender identity with sexual orientation. They don't seem any difference at all. Uh, yes, so I see what you mean. In the laws, I thought you meant in practice, yes. In the laws, obviously what the transvestite um, movement has tried to do is put uh, attach itself to the coattails of gay rights. They have always tried to do this. It is their model, in fact. So now we have something called queer politics, which includes transgenderism, which is actually about the wiping out of homosexuality, the wiping out of lesbians and gays, which is pretty shocking. And we've got a sort of rainbow flag. Us lesbian feminists always hated it because we knew it was against women and didn't include lesbians. But now we've got everything else in there as well. And, you know, it's all over the supermarkets and so on. It's supposedly about gay rights and transgenderism. It's, it's the most awful authoritarian takeover of our lives. So yes, in law and in the public imagination and in policy, very generally, there is a conflation of um, sexual orientation, homosexuality with transgenderism. And that's happening at an international level as well. And it's gay activists who are pushing all of this through. So we have the Yogyakarta principles, which are about both gay rights and uh, transvestism all in the same document mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. if you actually want to oppose these developments you can appear to be anti-homosexual anti-gay rights because these mm -hmm. things are put together and they are put together of course also in the uh, legislation on conversion identity I know um, con uh, conversion therapy I, I know you've had quite a bit of that in Australia and it's going all over the world which is where um governments for, for no tremendously good reason put forward legislation to forbid anybody to try to convert somebody who's gay into somebody straight. There seems to be very little of this, but there's a huge push for the laws because they attach to it, not converting somebody who's got a sort of natural and inevitable weird gender identity into somebody who realizes they have an ordinary biological sex. So in that way, they attach those things. And that's very, very problematic. Sorry, I didn't really understand. But yes, that's what's going on is uh, that actually a movement which wipes out homosexuality to a large extent. It says that you know, your sex shouldn't matter. Gay men should be able to have sex with trans men and women. Lesbians should have sex with men uh, who say that they're lesbians and so on. Homosexuality after 50 years of gay rights is wiped out. Can I just interrupt for a moment because Rachel, who is the co-host, needs to put up where you can, where everybody can buy the book. So Rachel, go ahead and put up the share the screen <laughs> um, because that. Uh, and I hope you can hear this. Yes, here we go. Okay, so that's the beginning, and um, so you can order directly from Spinifex Press in Australia. That's spinifexpress.com.au. In North America, you can go to our distributors, which is ipgbook.com, or you can go through the various uh, e-tailers, you know, the ones we don't like to mention. And in the UK, you can order from gazellebookservices.co.uk. But again, it is available in bookshops and it is available through the online uh, ones as well so um, yeah and if you're not in those three places order directly from Spinifex Press thanks thank you Rachel okay and there's a Rosa has put up a link up on the chat if you want to order it directly from Spinifex uh, yep okay that was a very interesting question and I think a very problematic one and, and it is really um, showing up in the, in the policy decisions and the ways in which uh, the question is framed uh, is, is, is also part of the problem. So yeah, a very good question, thanks. Ah, any more? Yeah, and Helen says, I think the general public are totally confused because of it. Yes, they are, because they 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 don't know the difference between uh, between LGB and 
and I now use the, the word TQ+, plus, um, because really TQ+, plus, they have a lot in common, and LGB have something in common, uh, because the LGB is sexual orientation, TQ+, plus is just crazy, um, and, and, and a con. <laughs> No. Yeah, I think there's, there's two big problems in the public um, recognition of what's going on here. One of them is, of course, that there, there were decades in which they were trained to accept homosexuality as not something wrong or evil or a, a mental health problem and so on. And that worked. You know, the attitudes in many countries towards homosexuality have changed. The legal penalties have gone. There's a great deal more acceptance. There's gay marriage, although I disapprove of marriage in any form, of course. So having had their minds massaged and trained to accept that there is not a problem with homosexuality, once the transvestites attached themselves to homosexuality, there was an automatic in. People felt very wrong, very rude, if they in any way felt a criticism mm. of transvestism, mm. because surely it was just like this homosexuality thing. Mm. Holbert mm. has asked, how do we teach girls in school to be aware of problematic men and to protect themselves without scaring them? <laughs> mm. I think, first of all, there has to be separate sex education, for sure. Um, and the sex education we have in schools at the moment is created, unfortunately, by queer activists. That is the case. It's the case in America. It's the case in Britain. Once upon a time in the 1970s, 1980s, when I was a teacher, feminists were creating sex education materials, which were very, very different. And now queer folks have actually dominated the agenda because of course they create the materials and they insinuate themselves in and this sex education is outsourced so we've got a huge problem with sex education generally which right now uh, trains children to believe that they can change sex and that all kinds of sexual practices are acceptable and so on so how do we train children um this is the fundamental problem of heterosexuality isn't it Women are not told the truth. They're not told that the men that they as associate with may sexually abuse their children. They're not told that their husbands may beat them up or possibly kill them. We cannot say those things because the whole society is constructed on the basis that the violence of men and the sexual violence of men must never be mentioned. It is rude and the wall must be pulled, pulled over women's eyes. Otherwise, how could romantic love and heterosexuality survive? So I don't have an easy answer to that question, except that it's the fundamental question of keeping compulsory heterosexuality going, which is the very basis of the system of male domination. Things that feminists invent always get appropriated by our enemies. <laughs> yeah. Very true. We do need to have something, our own um, campaign for an education system you know we need to like the safe schools program in australia has been so effective in infiltrating the schools and putting trans ideology into the schools well we, we feminists need to be you know doing a similar campaign but unfortunately we don't get the government funding to do these things yeah. so it's a it's, it's an impossible question because there's there's absolutely no funding for feminist campaigning i wonder if i could say something yep Okay, Lavender. Right. Um, we're going back a little bit, talking about campaigns. Um, the whole issue of gender doesn't get looked at cl clearly enough. I mean, you know, little girls are still being told that they can wear fairy dresses and be a nurse, but not be an aeronautical engineer, etc. And and so little girls that are called butch are told that they have to be they have to you know they have to trans hmm. uh, become trans. And so I think we've got to question the whole thing about how the language creates gender. I mean, we talked about this 30 and 40 years ago, remember? We called it sex roles and stuff. And uh, I can see Betty's <laughs> grinning because she's written about this too. Uh, and I really think we've got to just question. I mean, I just want to have gender expunged from language. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'll leave it to experts like Betty to, to um, get the curricula going. Mm. Well, that's the thing, but the, the gender thing is so confusing to the general public because it was just used as a euphemism for the word sex. So a lot of the time when it's being used on forms, people assume that it means, I mean, we, we almost need to now get rid of the word because it's so confusing. Mm -hmm. Well, when but, I'm asked a gender on a form, I cross it out and say 
six. Yeah. Of course, it's digital true, but, but on, on electronic forms, it's, yeah, it's hard to do that. So how often they're just asking sex is they're just using what they think is a polite word. So we need to sort of educate. I, I just try to tell people that gender is the socially constructed. It's femininity and masculinity, basically, and that mm -hmm. sex is where we're talking about something that's real. <laughs> but it is, but it is, it is true, Anna. That that is what we used to say. We used to, uh, with domestic violence issues and everything, we needed a gender analysis. We used to use the word yeah, gender it like that. Changeably. It meant it meant we needed to to make sure it was known that men did it to women. Yeah, I know. I so that's that's all about gender-based violence. Yeah. Yes. No, no, I've, got, I've got to stop it. The other day I said, oh, I've got to say sex-based violence because if you say gender, it's now yes, completely yes. confusing. I, I, yeah. I've critiqued the use of GBSV because it's a four-letter word. And I said the other really good four-letter word for that is rape. <laughs> uh. If you if you actually look back to works from the 70s, feminists were not using the term gender. No. Um, and no. a lot of us held out for a very long time against using that. We would only talk about sex, sex caste or um, sex class and sex. We never used the term gender. That started coming in in the 1980s. The socialist feminists who dominated sort of international feminist development stuff tended to use that term and brought that term in. But certainly in the beginning, we never used it. We talked about sex stereotypes, sex class and cast, sex caste. Yeah. That's, that's how it was. So it was a problematic term from the beginning and many of us recognized that and couldn't. We understood it was a euphemism. You know, sex is sort of a bit naughty. People don't want to say that. I think it's like, it's like masculinity and femininity. And of course, that's about sex stereotypes. So gender, it's like being asked, are you masculine or are you feminine on a form? That's extremely... Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's very, it's very like the word queer. Um, I was at a women's studies conference in New Zealand and a woman there said that she used the word queer in staff meetings because it sounded friendlier than the word lesbian. So it's the well, same well, sort yes. of thing that goes on in, in that. And, you know, you get further if you use the word <coughs> because people always revile <coughs> the word lesbian. Mm. I think we need to issue our own documents with these things to find the way we, because just like the other side, you know, the, the trans yes. movement, they, they issue things, they tell people, this is what the language means. You're now, yes. it's, That's it's right. this I mean, you know, they just make In the University of Melbourne in the 90s, I remember that oh. our Winners Studies Committee oh, wow. created um, a, a, a document on language, you know, which was all about how you shouldn't just say chairman oh. and so on and so on. And it was, it was adopted at that time oh. and was seen as very influential influential. Now all this new language has moved in and we need a completely, uh, we need new documents. The universities hate us anyway, but we need new documents to begin from. Mm. Well, if you have official looking documents, you know, then you can infiltrate. Yeah. That's what the, yeah, what, what the trans movement did. And, and in those that's documents, what, what you can do. tell people, don't call someone a cis woman because it's deeply offensive. That's right. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, Anna, we need to do it. I know I you're busy. But we need to do it. I, I have actually started such a document, um, but then I got a bit busy. But it's something I would like to get back to um, after we come back from. Yeah, Frankfurt. that'd be great. Yeah, so I have actually done most of it, but it still needs a bit of extra work. Okay, well... Um, Renata, do you have something you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, that's been a very fascinating discussion. So thank you to Betty and to Anna, and of course to Sheila for your very, very interesting remarks. Um, I mean, having had the, the, the privilege, I should say, to edit Sheila's book that uh, Pauline and Susan and I did, um, it has led us to ever such interesting uh, conversations and um, the whole discussion about consent actually Pauline thought we should try and have this consent chapter published as a, um, a separate paper we did send it to a few people but we did not get any responses you know surprisingly but it is a very very wonderful chapter um, I mean personally you know I feel that this book is probably one of the best that Sheila has ever written. It's probably also one of the most difficult to read, but we absolutely have to 
ready to understand that women will not advance if we do not take seriously what Sheila is saying about the, the male sex right and how it dominates women and women let ourselves be dominated. And in the context of surrogacy, I have written a chapter in the latest surrogacy book uh, that uh, says uh, we should go beyond the compassion trap. And by compassion trap, I mean um, that women are always nice and kind. And of course, we've been socialized into it. You know, little girls get brownie points and are told they're nice. If we're kind, we always said yes to everybody. And that, that then goes on to say, oh, yes, yes, yes. I will bear a child for you and just simply give this child away, which I grew in my own body. So I think the compassion trap really needs to be talked about in feminist circles. And women just have to stop being nice and kind. Maybe that's the next book from Spinifex. That sounds no, like well, a great title, Renata, the, the compassion trap. <laughs> it is a great title. And actually, uh, I came across it. It's also called the empathy trap by somebody else. But actually, the compassion trap goes back to a very... I only found one reference to the term, which is really quite fascinating. But anyway, um, it is probably time... Well, just to say it again, please read this book. Give it to absolutely everybody as a Christmas present and really read it and do uh, book groups around it because there's so much important stuff in this book that uh, you have to read it twice, three times, four times to really take everything in. I think Sheila has just done an absolutely fabulous job in putting this book together. So thank you, Sheila. And so thank you, just, thank you very yeah, much for publishing it and making it so beautiful and making it yes, so beautiful. Yes, I was just going to say something about that. You know, like you have this wonderful title, Penal Imperialism, that people say, oh, so what do you do? What cover do you do? And early on, uh, Sheila said, well, I got this, I saw this, I saw these digital images and they look like sperm and they look like um, sort of like it's not slime. sick and semen. It's not sick and semen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three yeah, S's. Right. And um, I said, all right, then send it. So Sheila sent this image, and then our wonderful, wonderful uh, graphic designer Deb Snipson made it <laughs> into this absolutely feminist, uh, fabulous cover. It looks really very beautiful, and yeah, it's a bit sort of like a, a put down. If you then say, yeah, that's not. <laughs> Snot and semen. And I'm glad I didn't realise it was snot and semen. <laughs> semen, and semen you know, that's it. I thought it was sort of just the world, but anyway. Yeah, it is, it. and it's very. It's, it really has turned out into a, a quite a remarkable cover as well. You know, not just beautiful, but also it's really very stunning. And the 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 also the combination of the yellow that they did with the green, it brings it all out. So it's actually. Also a very, very beautiful book, you know, I don't know what you make of this, but it is a very, you want to have it in your hands, you want to look at it. But the cover <laughs> belies the content, one could say. The, yes, that's right, that's right. Maybe it's a Trojan horse, but <laughs> it is very, very beautiful book because it has such a beautiful content. Ah, well, you will learn. So, um, <laughs> as I always say, books don't just get made by one person. Yes, there's the author, but then there's a whole group uh, of women in spin effects who make this book happen. Uh, then the first one I really want to uh, mention is Pauline Hopkins, who I think is here somewhere on, on the chat. And Pauline uh, and I had many, many good discussions about all these chapters that we're reading. And uh, But it was also a lot of hard work. I mean, the reference list is, I don't know how many pages long, but very, very long. <laughs> and uh, oh, I really hope we won't find any any um, mistakes in it. I should also thank Lavender, who very kindly uh, proofread the book, which was fantastic, Lavender, and found a very, very, very embarrassing mistake. Uh, we had Gids misspelled. The Gids is the gender clinic in London who has just um, been ordered to be closed next year. So it was greets or something so that would have been very embarrassing so thank you very i'm much obsessed with con with commas 
<laughs> commas, well, yes, that too, but you know, commas are in the eye of the beholder, but the geats that trumped it all, there was something else that you found it was very, very good. So thank you. Um, so thank you to Pauline for all your hard work on this. Then of course, um, we have our office manager, Marilyn, and her companion, Sharon, who's the office- um, Warehouse. The warehouse manager. <laughs> And then, of course, we have Danielle, trainee to Marilyn, as she calls herself, because she will take over from Marilyn as office manager at the end of the year. And Danielle is, is very, very good already at what she does. So we are in good hands. Um, Caitlin is our social um, media manager and does a fabulous job. And last but certainly not least is Rachel McDermott, um, who does all the publicity. Uh, now, we had an interesting experience for the first time in our, in the Spinifex life of 31 years. We were early enough with this manuscript that we could actually make uh, advanced reading copies, so-called ARCs in the States. So we uh, had them done at a sort of great, was caused a great sort of like upheaval, but we got them done. We sent them to all the major outlets, the New York Times, all the others. And guess what? We didn't get a single reply, which is, of course, to be expected. But it also actually means, or it told us really that because some, mostly we are too late. We don't have our books ready three to four months before they're published. With Sheila's books, we had it ready. We sent it out, we sent hard copies out with all the materials in it. It should have been taken up by at least somebody. And it was. Now, of course, it's going around very well in all the radical feminist circles. Uh, in England, we have, we have sent it to the major journalists, uh, et cetera, Glinner, et cetera, and of course, Posey. And we will see if something happens in print. We know that the book has a very bright future because it is actually going out very well. And it will be read. And as I said before, please, women, read it. Your life, our life, might be dependent on understanding what men are actually doing to women. So, just again, my big thanks to Betty, Anna, and Sheila, and everybody else who's helped make this book into a reality. So, thank you. And some of you we will see at Philia. And maybe Sheila will come to Australia, who knows? Maybe at the end of the year or next year, and then we can do a tour with Sheila <laughs> up to Townsville. And I'm sure Betty will be very happy to host Sheila and uh, then we can do it all again. So thank you. Thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. It's been uh, one of the most important books to work on this year. And that's not putting down all the other important books like the sex doll book by Kathleen and a very important book also he chose book Porn Over Me by um by Melinda Tanker Driest and of course we have lots of other books coming out you have to just look at our catalog which Rachel has put uh on our website so you can see why we all look tired and exhausted because we have just produced fantastic book after fantastic book after fantastic book but this has to be my favorite for the year so thank you very much. Thank you, Spinifex, for all your great work on all those amazing books. <laughs> thank you. We can all write on our gravestones. We tried. <laughs> we were good women and we tried. <laughs> because we do. We do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any right. other famous last words? Or should we just all go and leave Sheila to... Um, you know, have a nice day and us to um, have dinner. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, very much. Thank, thank you, everybody. And <laughs> lovely to speak with Australian sisters. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Spinifex. Thank you, Spinifex. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Lovely Bye. to see you all. Bye -bye. Lavender and Simone and various others. <laughs> yes, that was nice to see Simone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, bye. bye. All right, I'm going to end now.